Hello, I'm F. Scott Fitzgerald II, author of The Great Gatsby II, and you are watching The Dead Sullivan Graveyard Shift. Stop and read The Great Gatsby II. Why don't you? Hello, today we're going to be looking at The Great Gatsby II. Chapter 1. The Great Gatsby was floating in the water dead. Oh shit, said The Great Gatsby II. Now it's my turn to be the Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby, too, went to his friend Nick Carraway's house. Oh, shit, said Nick Carraway. Tis your Great Gatsby. I thought you were murdered in a pool by George Wilson because he thought you ran over his wife or whatever. Yeah, said the Great Gatsby, too. I'm the Great Gatsby, too, though. A different one, old sport. Oh, okay, said Nick Carraway. Yeah, said the Great Gatsby, too. Do you think I wouldn't make clones of myself in case George Wilson mistakenly believed I ran over his wife Myrtle and then shot me in a pool? Oh yeah, that makes sense, said Nick Carraway. Do you want to smoke weed or something? Yeah, okay, said the great Gatsby too. And they smoked some weed. Literary classic. Check it out.
What follows is a passage from The Great Gatsby 1, left out of the original reading due to technical difficulties. I wanted to get out and walk eastward toward the park through the soft twilight, but each time I tried to go, I became entangled in some wild strident argument which pulled me back as if with ropes into my chair. Yet high over the city, our line of yellow windows must have contributed their share of human secrecy to the casual watcher in the darkening streets. And I was him too, looking up and wondering. I was within and without, simultaneously ex ex enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. Myrtle pulled her chair close to mine, and suddenly her warm breath poured over me the story of the, her first meeting with Tom. It was on two little seats facing each other that are always the last ones left on the train. I was going up to New York to see my sister, and spent the night. He had on a dress suit and a patent leather shoes, and I couldn't help my eyes off him. But every time he looked at me, I had to pretend to be looking at the advertisement over his head. When we came into the station, he was next to me, and his white shirt front pressed against my arm. And so I told him I'd have to call a policeman, but he knew I lied. I was so excited that when I got into a taxi with him, I didn't hardly know I was into getting into a subway train. All I kept thinking about over and over was, you can't live forever. You can't live forever. She turned to Mrs. McKee, and the room rang, full of her artificial laughter. My dear, she cried, I'm going to give you this dress as soon as I'm through with it. I've got to get another one tomorrow. I'm going to make a list of all the things I've got to get. A massage, and a wave, and a collar for the dog, and one of those cute little ashtrays where you touch a spring, and a wreath with a black silk bow of her, from Mother's grave that lasts all summer. I got to write down a list so I won't forget all the things I got to do. It was nine o'clock. Almost immediately afterwards, I looked at my watch and found it was ten. Mr. McKee was asleep on a chair with his fists clenched in his lap. Like a photograph of a man of action, taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheek and remains of the spot of dried lather that had worried me all the afternoon. The little dog was sitting on the table, looking with blind eyes to the smoke, and from time to time, groaning faintly. People disappeared, reappeared, made plans to go somewhere, and then lost each other. Searched for each other, found each other a few feet away. Some time toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Mrs. Wilson stood face to face, discussing in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. Daisy, 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 shouted Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want to. Daisy, da- Making a short, deft movement, Tom Buckman broke her nose with his open hand. Then there were bloody towels upon the bathroom floor, and women's voices scolding and high over the confusion, a long broken wail of pain. Mr. McKee awoke from his doze and stared in a daze toward the door. When he had gone halfway, he turned around and stared at the scene, his wife and Catherine scolding and consoling as they stumbled here and there among the crowded furniture with articles of aid, and then and the despairing figure on the couch bleeding fluently and trying to spread a copy of Town Tattle over the tapestry scenes of Versailles. Then Mr. McKee turned and continued on out the door, taking my hat from the chandelier. I followed. Come to lunch some day, he suggested, as we groaned down in the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands off the lever, snapped the elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee, with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agreed. I'll be glad to. I was standing beside his bed, and he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear with a great portfolio in his hand. Beauty and the Beast, Loneliness, Old Grocery Horse, Brooks Bridge, 
Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lower level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the morning, Tribune, and waiting for the four o'clock train. And that is the end of chapter two. I will be back in a moment. And now, our regularly scheduled reading from Part 3 of The Great Gatsby 1. A succulent hash arrived, and Mr. Wolvensheim, forgetting the more sen sentimental atmosphere of the old metropole, began to eat with ferocious delicacy. His eyes, meanwhile, roved very slowly all around the room. He completed the arc by turning to inspect the people directly behind. I think that, except for my presence, he would have taken the one short glance beneath our own table. Look here, old sport, said Gatsby, leaning over me. I'm afraid I made you a little angry this morning in the car. There was that smile again, but this time I held out against it. I don't like mysteries, I answered, and I don't understand why you won't come out and frankly tell me what you want. Why has it all gone to come through Miss Baker? Oh, it's nothing underhand, he assured me. Uh, Miss Baker's a great sportswoman, you know, and she'd never do anything that wasn't all right. Suddenly, he looked at his watch, jumped up, and hurried from the room, leaving me with Mr. Wolfensheim at the table. He has to telephone, said Mr. Wolfensheim, following him with his eyes. Fine fellow, isn't he? Handsome to look at, and a perfect gentleman. Yes, he's an Oxford man. Oh? He went to Oxford College in England. You know Oxford College? I've heard of it. It's one of the most famous colleges in the world. Have you known Gatsby for a long time? I inquired. Several years, he answered in a gratified way. I made the pleasure of his acquaintance just after the war, but I knew I had discovered a man of fine breeding after I talked with him an hour. I said to myself, there's the kind of man you'd like to take home and introduce to your mother and sister. He paused. I see you're looking at my cuff buttons. I hadn't been looking at them, but I did now. They were composed of an oddly familiar piece of ivory. Finest specimen of human molars, he informed me. Well, uh, I inspected them. That's a very interesting idea. Yeah, he flipped his sleeves up under his coat. Yeah, Gatsby, Gatsby's very careful about women. He would never so much as look at a friend's wife. When the subject of this, instri of this instinct... When the subject of this instinctive trust returned to the table and sat down, Mr. Wolvensheim drank his coffee with a jerk and got to his feet. I have enjoyed my lunch, he said, and I think I gotta run off from you two young men before I outstay my welcome. Don't hurry, Ma Don't hurry, Meyer, said Gatsby, without enthusiasm. Mr. Wolvensheim raised his hand in a sort of benediction. You're very polite, but I belong to another generation, he announced solemnly. You sit here and discuss your sports and your young ladies and your... He supplied an imaginary noun with an other wave of his hand. As for me, I am fifty years old, and I won't impose myself on you any longer. As he shook hands and turned away, his tragic nose was trembling. I wondered if I had said anything to offend him. He becomes very sentimental sometimes, explained Gatsby. This is one of his sentimental days. 
He's quite a character around New York, a denizen of Broadway. Who is he, anyhow? An actor? No, a dentist. Meyer Wolvensheim? No, he's a gambler. Gatsby's hesitant, then added coolly, He's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. Fixed the World Series, I repeated. The idea staggered me. I had remembered, of course, that the World Series had been fixed in 1990, but if I had thought it of it at all, I would have thought of it as a thing that merely happened. The end of some inevitable chain. It never occurred to me that one man could start to play with the faith of 50 million people with the single-mindedness of a burglar blowing a safe. How did he happen to do that? I asked after a minute. He just saw the opportunity. Why isn't he in jail? I can't get him, old sport. He's a smart man. I insisted on paying the check as the waiter brought me my change. I caught sight of Tom Bach of Tom of Tom Bach Buchanan across the crowded room. Come along with me for a minute, I said. I've got to say hello to someone. When he saw us, Tom jumped up and looked half a dozen steps in our direction. Where have you been? he demanded eagerly. Daisy's furious because you haven't called up. Uh, this is Mr. Gatsby, Mr. Buchanan. They shook hands briefly, and a strained, unfamiliar look of embarrassment came over Gatsby's face. How have you been, anyhow? demanded Tom of me. How did you happen to come up with this up this far? How did you happen to come up this far to eat? I've been having lunch with Mr. Gatsby. I turned toward Mr. Gatsby, but he was no longer there. One October day in 1917, said Jordan Baker in that afternoon, sitting up very straight on a straight chair in the tea garden at the Plaza Hotel. I was walking along from the one place to another, half on the sideways and half on the lawns, half on the sidewalks and half on the and half on the lawns. I was happier on the lawns because I had on shoes from England with rubber knobs on the soles. Uh, are you going to uh, plug in that into the power strip? If there is space. If you take the one on the end, there that one's unimportant. End? Yes. Oh, this one right here? Yes. The one that's like the one where the cord has been pulled very tautly. Oh. That's a different one. I unplugged something else. Okay. Th what else? What else? Which uh, one? Well, you just don't remove any boxes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Oui, oui. I was happier on the lawns because I had on shoes from England with rubber knobs on the shoes on the soles that bit into the soft ground. I had on a new plaid shirt skirt. I had on a new plaid skirt also that blew a little in the wind, and whenever this happened the red, white, and blue blanners in front of all the houses stretched out and stiff and said tut 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 in a disapproving way. The largest of the banners and the largest of the lawns belonged to Daisy Fay's house. She was just eighteen, two years older than me, and by far the most popular of all the young girls in Louisville. She dressed in white and had little white rotisters, and all day long the telephone rang in her house, and excited young officers from Camp Taylor demanded the privilege of monopolizing her that night anyways, for an hour. And I came opposite her house that after that morning. Her white road stirs was beside the curb, and she was sitting in with a lieutenant I had never seen before. They had so engrossed in each other that she didn't see me until I was fifty-five feet away. Hello, Jordan, she called unexpectedly. Please come up over here. I was flattered, that she wanted to speak to me because of all the older girls I admired her most. She asked me if I was going to the Red Cross and make ba bandages. She asked me if I was going to the Red Cross and make bandages. I was. Well, then would I tell? Well, then would I tell them that she couldn't come that day? 
The officer looked at Daisy while she was speaking, in a way that every young girl wants to be looked at sometime, and because it seemed romantic to me, I have remembered the incident ver ever since. His name was Jay Gatsby, and I didn't lay eyes on him again for, a no for over four years. Even after I had met him on Long Island, I didn't realize it was the same man. That was 1917. By the next year, I had a few, books, a few books myself, and I began to play in tournaments, so I didn't see Daisy very often. She went with a slightly older crowd, and when she went with anyone at all, while wild rumors were circulating around her, how her mother had found her packing her bag one winter night to go to New York and say goodbye to a soldier who was going overseas, she was effectually prevented, but she wasn't on speaking terms with her family for several weeks. After that, she didn't play around with the soldiers anymore, but only with a few flat-footed, short-sighted young men in town who couldn't get into the army at all. By the next autumn, she was gay again. Gay as ever. She had a debut after the armistice she had a debut after the armistice, and in February she was presumably engaged to a man from New Orleans. In June she married Tom Buchanan of Chicago, with more pomp and circumstance than Louisville ever knew before. He came down with a hundred people in four private cars, and hired a whole floor of the Seal Sealback Hotel, and the day before the wedding he gave her a string of pearls valued at three hundred and fifty dollars. I was a bridesmaid, and I came into her room half an hour before the bridal dinner, and found her lying at, on her bed as lovely as the June night in her flowered dress, and as drunk as a monkey. She had a bottle and sauterine in one hand and a letter in the other. Gratulate me, she muttered. Never had a drink before, but oh, how I do enjoy it. What's the matter, Daisy? I was scared, I can tell you. I had never seen a girl like that before. Here, dearies, she groped around in a wastebasket she had with her on the bed and pulled out the string of pearls. Take them downstairs and give them back to whomever they belong to. Tell them all Daisy change her mind. Say, da Daisy's change her mind. She began to cry, and she cried and cried. I rushed out and found her mother's maid, and we locked the door and got her into a cold bath. She wouldn't let go of the letter. She took it into the tub with her and squeezed it up into a wet bowl and told and let and only let me leave it in the soap dish when she saw that it was coming to pieces like snow. But she didn't l say another word. We gave her spirit, we gave her spirits of ammonia, and put ice in her forehead, and hooked her back into her dress. And half an hour later, when we walked out of the room, the pearls were around her neck, and the incident was over. Next day at five o'clock, she married Tom Buchanan without so much as a shiver, and started off on a three-month trip to the South Seas. I saw them in Santa Barbara when they came back, and I thought I had never seen a girl so mad about her husband. If he left the room for a minute, she'd look around uneasily and say, Where's Tom gone? And wear the most abstracted expression until she saw him coming in the door. She used to spit on the sand with his head in her lap by the hour, rumbling her fingers over his eyes, and looking at him with unfathomable delight. It was touching to see them so together. It made you laugh in a hushed, fascinated way. That was in August, a week after I left Santa Barbara. Tom ran into a wagon on the, Ver on the Ventura Road one night and ripped a front wheel off his car. The girl who was with him got into the papers, too, because her arm was broken. She was one of the chambermaids in the Santa Barbara Hotel. The next April, Daisy had her little girl, and they went to France for a year. I saw them one spring in Cannes, and later in du in Deauville, and then they came back to Chicago to see Is everything down. going well? 
Yes. Is everything going well? Yes, it is. Thank you. Daisy was popular in Chicago, as you know. They moved with a fast crowd, all of them young and rich and wild. But she came out with an absolute perfect reputation. Perhaps she doesn't drink. It's a great advantage not to drink among hard-drinking people. You can hold your tongue, and moreover, you can time any little in irregularity of your own so that everybody else is so blind that they don't see or care. Perhaps Daisy never went in for a more at all, and yet there's something in that voice of hers. Well, about six weeks ago, she heard the name Gatsby for the first time in years. It was when I asked you, do you remember if you, if you knew Gatsby in West Egg? After you had gone home, she came into my room and woke me up and said, What Gatsby? And when I described him, I was half asleep. She said in the strangest voice that it must be the man she used to know. It wasn't until then that I connected this Gatsby with the officer in her white car. When Jordan Baker had finished telling me all this, we had left the plaza for half an hour and were driving in a, vicar in a Victoria through Central Park. The sun had gone down behind the tall apartments of the movie stars in the West 50s and the clear voices of little girls already gathered like crickets on the grass rose through the hot twilight. I am the Sheik of Arabi. Your love belongs to me. At night when you're asleep, into your tent I'll creep. It was a strange coincidence, I said, but it wasn't a coincidence at all. Why not? Gatsby bought that house so that Daisy would be just across the bay. When it had not then it had not been merely the stars to which he had aspired on that June night. He, he came alive to me, delivered suddenly from the womb of his purposeless splendor. He wants to know, continued Jordan, if you'll invite Daisy to your house some afternoon and then let him come over. The modesty of the demand shook me. He had waited five years and bought a mansion where he dispensed starlight to casual moths so that he could come over? Some afternoon to a stranger's garden? Did I have to know all of this before he could ask such a little thing? He's afraid he's waited so long. He thought he might be offended. You see, he's a regular tough underneath it all. Something worried me. Why didn't he ask you to arrange a meeting? He wants her to see his house, she explained, and your house is right next door. Oh. I think he half expected her to wander into one of his parties some night and went oh, night, went on Jordan, but she never did. Then he began asking people casually if they knew her, and I was the first one he found. It was the night he sent for me at his dance, and you should have heard the elaborate way he worked up to it. Of course, I immediately suggested a luncheon in New York, and I thought he'd go mad. I don't want to do anything out of the way, he kept saying. I, I want to see her right next door. When I said you were a particular friend of Tom's, he started to abandon the whole idea. He doesn't know very much about Tom, though he says he's read a Chicago paper for years just on the chance of catching a glimpse of Daisy's name. It was dark now. And as we dipped under a light bridge, I put my arm around Jordan's golden shoulder and drew her toward me and asked her to dinner. Suddenly, I wasn't thinking of Daisy and Gatsby anymore, but of his clean, hard, limited person who dealt in a universal specimen skepticism and who leaned back jauntily just within the circle of my arm. A phrase began to beat in my ears with a sort of he heady excitement. They are, there are only the pursued and the pursuing, the busy and the tired. And Daisy ought to have something in her life, murmured Jordan to me. Does she want to see Gatsby? She's not to know about it. Gatsby doesn't want her to know. She's just supposed to invite her to tea. We passed a barrier of dark trees, and then the facade of 59th Street, a block of delicate pale light beamed down into the park. Unlike Gatsby and Tom Buchanan, I had no girl whose disembodied face floated along the dark cords, uh, currencies and blinding signs, and so I drew up the girl beside me, 
tightening my arm. Her wan, scornful mouth smiled, and so I drew her up, and so I drew up again closer, this time to my face. And that is the end of chapter four. Yeah, and your question was to just kind of tell you about myself in the movie. Yeah, just uh, like uh, what's your uh, what's your background? Uh, how did you uh, conceive of this project? Uh, how did this all get started? I started out wanting to be a cartoonist and kind of evolved from cartooning to storyboarding to filmmaking. And now um, I work full time as a freelance producer, director and uh, director of photography. Monster Force Zero was a, a project that Megan McGrath uh, brought me on and to direct. Um, she was tapped by Mike Pasito, our executive producer who wrote it. Um, he was uh, motivated. One, two, buckle my shoe. It's The Great Gatsby 2, the newest book from Dead Sullivan Productions. Read it, the next great American novel. The Great Gatsby, two, chapter two. As the Great Gatsby two and Nick Carraway sat in Nick's apartment and got stoned, Jordan and Daisy were also smoking weed somewhere. It's pretty fucked up that the great Gatsby got murdered in a pool by George Wilson, said Jordan. Yeah, but he'll probably come back as a clone or something, said Daisy. Oh yeah, that makes sense, said Jordan. Or maybe he has an evil twin, said Daisy. That would be crazy, said Jordan. And she took a massive bong rip. Then Tom came in and said something racist, probably. Faust by Goethe. Prologue in heaven. The Lord, the heavenly hosts, Mephistopheles following. 
the three archangels step forward. Raphael, the chanting sun as ever rivals the chanting of his brother spheres and marches round his destined circuit, a march that thunders in our ears. His aspect cheers the hosts of heaven, though what his essence none can say. These inconceivable creations keep the high state of their first day. Gabriel. And swift, with inconceivable swiftness, the Earth's full splendor rolls around. Celestial radiance alternating with a dread night too deep to sound. The sea against the rock's deep bases comes foaming up in far-flung force, and rock and sea go whirling onward in the swift sphere's eternal course. Michael. And to storms in rivalry are raging, from sea to land, from land to sea, in frenzy forge the world a girdle, from which no inmost part is free. The blight of lightning flaming yonder marks where the thunderbolt will play. And yet thine envoys, Lord, revere the gentle movement of thy day. Choir of Angels Thine aspect cheers the hosts of heaven, though what thine essence none can say, that all thy loftiest creations keep the high state of their first day. Enter Mephistopheles. Since you, O Lord, once more approach and ask if business down with us be light or heavy, Oh, bonjour, and Satan. And in the past, you've usually welcomed me. That's why you see me also at your levy. Excuse me, I can't manage lofty words. Not though your whole court jeer and find me low. My pathos certainly would make you laugh, had you not left off laughing long ago. Your suns and worlds mean nothing much to me. How men torment themselves, that's all I see. The little god of the world, one can't reshape, reshade him. He is as strange today as that first day you made him. His life would be not so bad, not quite, had you not granted him a gleam of heaven's light. He calls it reason, uses it not the least, Except to, me more, except to be more beastly than any beast. He seems to me, if your honor does not mind, like a grasshopper, the long-legged kind, that's always in flight and leaps as it flies. And then the grass strikes up its same old song. I can only wish he confined himself to the grass. He thrusts his nose into every filth, alas. Lord. Mephistopheles, have you no other news? Do you always come here to accuse? Is nothing ever right in your eyes on earth? No, Lord. I find things there are downright bad as ever. I am sorry for men's days of dread and dearth. Poor things, my wish to play them isn't fervent. Do you know Faust? The doctor? I, my servant. Indeed, he serves you oddly enough, I think. The fool has no earthly habits in meat and drink. The ferment in him drives him wide and far. That he is mad, he too has almost guessed. He demands of heaven each fairest star, and of earth each highest joy and best. And all that is new and all that is far, can bring no calm to the deep sea swell of his breast. Now, he may serve me only gropingly. Soon I shall lead him into the light. The gardener knows when the sapling first turns green that flowers and fruit will make the future bright. What do you wager? You will lose him yet provided you give me permission to steer him gently the course I set. So long as he walks the earth alive, 
so long as you may try what enters your head. Men make mistakes as long as they strive. I thank you for that. As regards the dead, the dead have never taken my fancy. I favor cheeks that are full and rosy red. No corpse is welcome to my house. I work as the cat does with the mouse. Very well, you have my full permission. Divert this soul from its primal source, and carry it, if you can seize it, down with you upon your course. And stand ashamed when you must needs admit a good man with his groping intuitions still knows the path that is true and fit. All right, but it won't last for long. I'm not afraid my bet will turn out wrong. And if my aim prove true and strong, allow me to triumph wholeheartedly. Dust shall be eat, and greedily, like my cousin the snake renowned in tale and song. That too you are free to give a trial. I have never hated the likes of you. Of all the spirits of denial, the Joker is the last that I eschew. Man finds relaxation too attractive, too fond too soon of unconditional rest, which is why I am pleased to give him a companion who lures and thrusts and must, as devil, be active. But ye, true sons of heaven, it is your duty to take your joy in the living wealth of beauty the changing essence, which ever works and lives, wall you around with love, serene, secure, and that which floats in flickering appearance, fix ye it firm in thoughts that must endure. Choir of Angels. Thine aspect cheers the hosts of heaven, though what thine essence none can say, and all thy loftiest creations keep the high state of their first day. Heaven closes. Mephistopheles. Alone. I like to see the old one now and then, and try to keep relations on the level. It's really decent of so great a person to talk so humanely, even to the devil. I'm the devil. I'm the devil. I can take any form I like. I'm the devil. Grab this man on the way out. And I try to escape. So they have a pitchfork. Oh, they got a pitchfork. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I have to beat that out. I don't know. Nah. What's doing. Uh, I I want my show back. Give me my show. I don't fear death. I uh, don't fear. Uh, I'm being cast oh, out. Ah. Uh, yeah. The power of Christ compels me. Fuck you. <laughs> My compliments to the chef. Actually, I have no cop. Got bubbles on my egg. Sorry about the disturbance, I was out. It's no problem, there's a woman who keeps blowing bubbles on my eggs. Also, who made these eggs? They put seasoning on the eggshells. Alfredo Aldini. I knew it was him, probably because he literally handed it to me. He's but a rat bastard. He is a rat bastard, just like Hemingway. <laughs> Who, what? You're getting bubbles on my egg! Oh my god, what kind of establishment are we running here? I just want to eat my egg. You're talking crap 
about Alfredo Altini's food? Alfredo, who the fuck put seasoning on the eggshells? <laughs> it's from Italian. They're cool. They're Leave. Talk to you later. Who are you? Ugh, this job. Not enough people have an appreciation for classic literature. My dear readers, I don't even know why I call you readers. You're not reading this, you're watching this. <sighs> so many people are just so preoccupied. They can't take the time to step outside themselves through fiction and see their own lives in a mirror. Right, well, bottoms up. Oh, there's still eggshell on this. Ugh. Oh boy. Mm. Oh god. Um. Well, that's quite the egg. life, I suppose. Life is well-intentioned, but ultimately disappointing. <sighs> I just wanted to run a cultured show about The Great Gatsby, the first book, and woman blowing bubbles at me. I just... I need a drink. <sighs> Alright, well... That's that, I suppose. Back to The Great Gatsby. What kind of establishment are we running here? There is like a classy one. There's women's blowing bubbles. There's people who put seasoning on eggs shells. We are staying in the inn of TJ Ecclesburg. Sure. Speaking of eggs, chapter five. When I came home to West Egg, the night I was afraid of for a moment that my house was on fire. Two o'clock and the whole corner of the peninsula was blazing with light, which fell unreal on the shrubbery and made this elongating glimpse up, up upon the roadside wires. Turning a corner, I saw that it was Gatsby's house lit from the tower at a seat to ceiling. At first I thought it was another party, a wild rout that had resolved itself into hide-and-go-seek, or sadiness in the box, with all the house thrown open to the game. But there wasn't a sound, only wind in the, street, in the trees, which blew the wires and made the lights go off and on again, as if the house had winked into the darkness. As my taxi groaned away, I saw Gatsby walking toward me across his lawn. Your place looks like the World's Fair, I said. Does it? He turned his eye toward it absently. I've been 
glancing into some of the rooms. Let's go to Coney Island, old sport, in my car. It's too late. Well, I suppose we take a plunge in the swimming pool. I haven't made use of it all summer. I've got to go to bed. All right. He waited, looking at me with suppressed eagerness. I talked with Miss Baker. I said after a mo- I said after a moment, I'm going to call up Daisy tomorrow and invite her over t here to tea. Oh, that's all right, he said carelessly. I don't want to put you into any trouble. What day would you suit you? What day would suit you? He corrected me quickly. I don't want to put you in any trouble, you see. How about the day after tomorrow? He considered for a moment. Then with reluctance, I want to get the grass cut, he said. We both looked at the grass. There was a sharp line where my ragged lawn ended and the dark and the darker, well-kept expanse of his began. I suspected that he meant my grass. There's another little thing, he said uncertainly and hesitant. Would you rather put it off for a few days, I asked. Oh, it isn't about that. Uh, at least, he fumbled with... You are interrupting literature. You know what? I don't mind. I'll just keep reading. <sighs> I don't even know where I was. I'm so angry. There's another little thing, he said uncertainly and hesitated. Would you rather put it off for a few days, I asked? Oh, it isn't about that. At least, he fumbled with a series of beginnings. Why, I thought, what? Look here, old sport, you don't make much money, do you? Not very much. This seemed to reassure him, and he continued more confidently. I thought you didn't, if you'll pardon me. You see, I carry on a little business on the side, a sort of sideline, you understand? And I thought that you don't make very much. You're selling bonds, aren't you, aren't you, old sport? I'm trying to. Well, this would interest you. It wouldn't take up much of your time, and I thought you might pick up a nice bit of money. It happens to be a rather confidential sort of thing. I realize now that under different circumstances, that conversation might have been one of the crises of my life. But because the offer was obviously and tactlessly for a service of the be rendered, I had no choice except to cut him off there. I've got my hands full, I said. I'm much obliged, but I couldn't take on any more work. You wouldn't take... You wouldn't have to do any business uh, with Wolfenstein. Evidently, he thought that I was shying away from the gonagation mentioned at lunch, but I assured him he was wrong. He waited a moment longer, hoping that I, I'd begin a conversation, but I was too absorbed to be responsive, so he kept, he went unwillingly home. The evening had made me lightheaded and happy. I think I walked into a deep sleep as I entered my front door, so I don't know whether or not Gatsby went to Coney Island, or for how many hours he glanced into rooms, while his house blades gaudily on. I called on Daisy from the office next morning and invited her to come to tea. Don't bring Tom, I warned her. What? Don't bring Tom. Who is Tom? He asked innocently. The day agreed The day agreed upon was pouring rain. At eleven o'clock a man in a raincoat dragged a lawnmower, tapped at my front door, and said that Mr Gatsby had sent him over to cut my grass. This reminded me that I had forgotten to tell my Finn to come back, so I 
drove into West Egg Village to search for another soggy whitewashed alleys and to buy some cups and lemons and flowers. The flowers were unnecessary, for at two o'clock a greenhouse arrived from Gatsby's with innumerable receptacles to contain it. An hour later, the front door opened nervously, and Gatsby, in a white flannel suit, silver hair, and gold-colored tie, hurried in. He was pale, and there was dark signs of sleepiness beneath his eyes. "'Is everything all right?' he asked immediately. "'The grass looks fine, if that's what you mean.' "'What grass?' he inquired blankly. "'Oh, the grass in the yard!' He looked out the window at it, but, judging from his expression, I don't believe he saw a thing. "'Looks very good,' he remarked vaguely. Uh, "'One of the papers said they thought the rain would uh, stop about four. Uh, I think it was the journal. Uh, have you got everything you need in the shape of uh, a tea?' I took him into the pantry, where he looked a little repro reproachfully at the fin. Together we scrutinized the twelve lemon cake from the delicacies shop. "'Will they do?' I asked. Of course, of course, uh, they're fine, uh, he added hollowly. Old sport. The rain cooled about half past three to a damp mist through which occasional thin drops swam like dew. Gatsby looked with vacant eyes through a copy of Clay's Economics, starting at the finish tread, the shook the kitchen floor and the peering toward the bleared windows from time to time, as if a series of invisible but alarming happenings were taking place outside. Finally, he got up and informed me in an uncertain voice that he was going home. Why's that? Nobody's coming to tea. It's too late. He looked at his watch as if there was some pressing demand on the time elsewhere. I can't wait all day. Don't be silly. It's just two minutes to four. He sat down miserably, as if I had pushed him, and simultaneously there was the sound of a motor turning into my lane. We both jumped up, a little harrowed myself. I went out into the yard. Under the dripping bare lilac trees, a large open car was coming. Coming up. Under the dripping bare lilac trees, a large open car was coming up the drive. It stopped. Daisy's face tipped sideways beneath a three cornered la lavender hat looked out at me with a bright, ecstatic smile. Is this absolutely where you live, my dearest one? Ugh. The exhilarating ripple of her voice was a wild tonic in the rain. I had to follow the sound of it for a moment, up and down with my ears alone, before any word came through. A damp streak of hair laid like a dash of blue paint across her cheek, and her hand was wet with glistening drops as I took it help as I took it to help from the car. Are you in love with me? she said low in my ear, or why did I have to come alone? That's the secret of Castle Rackeret. Tell your chauffeur to go far away and spend an hour. Come back in an hour, Ferdy? Come back in an hour, Ferdy. Then in a grave murmur, his name is Ferdy. Does the gasoline affect his nose? I don't think so, she said innocently. Why? We went in, and to my overwhelming surprise, the living room was deserted. Well, that's funny, I exclaimed. What's funny? She turned her head as there was a light, dissignified knocking at the front door. I went out and opened it. Gatsby, pale as death, with his hand plunged like ways in his coat pockets, was standing in a puddle of water, glaring tragically into my eyes. With his hand still in his coat pocket, he talked by me into the hall, turned sharply as if there were on a wire, and disappeared into the living room. It wasn't even... It wasn't a bit funny. Aware of the loud beating of my own heart, I pulled the door to against the incinerated rain. For a half a minute, there wasn't a sound. Then, from the living room, I heard a sort of choking murmur, and part of a laugh followed by Daisy's voice on a clear, artificial note. I certainly am awfully glad to see you again. A pause. It endured horribly. I had nothing to do in the hall, so I went into the room. 
Gatsby, his hands still in his pockets, was reclining against the mantelpiece in a strained counterfeit of perfect ease, even of boredom. His head leaned back so far that it rested against the face of a defunct mantelpiece clock, and from his position his distraught eyes stared down at Daisy, who was sitting, frightened but graceful on the edge of the stiff chair. "'We've met before,' muttered Gatsby. His eyes glanced momentarily at me, and his lips parted with an abhorrent attempt at a laugh. Luckily, the, clou the clock took his... Luckily, the clock took this moment to tilt dangerously at the precipice. Luckily, the clock took this moment to tilt dangerously at the pressure of his head, whereupon he turned and caught it with tre trembling fingers and set it back in place. Then he sat down rigidly, his elbows on the arm of the sofa and his chin in his hand. I'm sorry about the clock, he said. My own face had now assumed a deep tropical burn. I couldn't muster up a single commonplace out of the thousands in my head. It's an old clock, I told him, I duck, idiotically. I think we all believed for a moment that it had smashed in pieces on the floor. We haven't met for many years, said Daisy, her voice as matter-of-fact as it could ever be. Five years next November. The automatic quality of Gatsby's answer set us all back at least another minute. I had them both on their feet with a desperate suggestion that they help me make tea in the kitchen when the domestic, when the demonic Finn brought it in on a tray. Amid the welcome confusion of cups and cakes and a certain physical decency established itself, Gatsby got himself into a shadow, and while Daisy and I talked, looked, consist looked consistuously from one Consensuously? Consensuously? Conscious? Consciously. And looked consciously from one to the other, and of with tense, unhappy eyes. However, as calmness wasn't at an end in it itself, I made an excuse at the first possible moment and got to my feet. Where are you going? demanded Gatsby, in immediate alarm. I'll be back. I've got to speak to you about something before you go. He followed me wildly into the kitchen and then closed the door and whispered, Oh, God, in a miserable way. What's the matter? This is a terrible mistake, he said, shaking his head from side to side. A terrible, terrible mistake. You're just embarrassed, that's all. And luckily, and luckily, I added, Daisy's embarrassed too. She's embarrassed? He repeated incredulously. Just as much as you are. Don't talk so loud. You're acting like a little boy, I broke out impatiently. Not only that, but you're rude. Daisy's sitting there all alone. He raised his hand to stop my words, looked at me with, un with unforgettable reproach, and, opening the door, cautiously, went back into the other room. I walked out the back way, just as Gatsby had when, had when he had made his nervous circuit of the house half an hour before, and ran for a huge black knotted tree whose massed leaves made a fabric against the rain. Once more it was pouring, and my irregular lawn, well shaven by Gatsby's gardener, abounded a small muddy swamp and prehistoric marshes. There was nothing to look at from under the trees except Gaps Gatsby's enormous house, so I stared at it, like Kant at his church steeple, for a half an hour. A brewer had built it early in the period, craze a decade before, and there was a story that he had agreed to pay five years' taxes on the neighboring cottages if the owners would have their roofs thatched with straw. Perhaps their refusal took the heart out of his place to found a, fa to found a family. He went into an immediate decline. His children sold his house with the black wreath still on the door. Americans, while occasionally willing to be serfs, have always been obstinate about being peasantry. After half an hour, the sun shone again, and the grocer's automobile rounded Gatsby's drive with the raw material for his servants. Dinner, I felt sure he wouldn't eat a spoonful. A maid began opening his, 
began opening the upper windows of his house, appeared momentarily in each, and leading from a large central bay, spat meditatively into the garden. It was time I went back while the rain continued. It had seemed like the murmur of their voices, rising and swelling a little now, and then with gusts of emotion. But in the new silence, I felt that silence had fallen within the house, too. I went in after making every possible noise in the kitchen, short of pushing over the stove. But I don't believe they heard a sound. They were sitting at either end of the couch, looking at each other as if some question had been asked for, or was in the air. And every vestige of embarrassment was gone. Daisy's face was smeared with tears, and when I came in, she jumped up and began wiping at it with her handkerchief before a mirror. But there was a change in Gatsby that was simply confounding. He literally glowed. Without a word or a gesture of exultation, a new well-being radiate, well radiated from him and filled the little room. Oh, hello, old sport, he said as if he hadn't seen me for years. I thought for a moment he was going to shake hands. It's stopped raining. Has it? When he realized what I was talking about, there were twinkle bells of sunshine in the room. He smiled like a weatherman, like a ecstatic patron of, of recurrent light, and repeated the news to Daisy. What do you think of that? It stopped raining. I'm glad, Jay, her throat full of aching, grieving beauty, told only of her unexpected joy. I want you and Daisy to come over to my house, he said. I'd like to show her around. You're sure you want me to come? Absolutely, old sport. <clears throat> Daisy went upstairs to wash her face. Too late, I thought, with humiliation of my towel. While Gatsby and I waited on the lawn, her house looks... While Gatsby waited on the lawn. My house looks well, doesn't it? He demanded. See how the whole front of it catches the light? I agreed that it was splendid. Yes, his eyes went over it. Every arched door and square tower, it looked. It took me just three years to earn the money that bought, that bought it. I thought you inherited your money. I did, old sport, he said automatically, but I lost most of it in the war, in the big panic, the panic of the war. I think he hardly knew what he was saying, for when I asked him what business he, what business he was in, he answered, that's my affair before he realized that it wasn't an appropriate reply. <clears throat> Please do excuse, excuse me. I was in the drug business, and then I was in the oil business. Oh, I've been in several things, he corrected himself. I was in the drug business, and then I was in the oil business. But I'm not in either one now. He looked at me with more attention. Do you mean you're... Do you mean you've been thinking over what I proposed the other night? Before I could answer, Daisy came up out of the house, and two rows of, br of brass button on her dress gleamed in the sunlight. That huge place there, she cried, pointing. Do you like it? I love it, but I don't see how you live there at all, all alone. I keep it always full of interesting people, night and day. People who do interesting things. Celebrated people. Instead of taking the shortcut along the sound, we went down the road to the road and entered by the big postern. With enchanting murmurs, Daisy admired this aspect of that, of the feudal silhouette against the sky, admired the gardens, the sparkling odor of Jean, Jean Gilles, and the further and the fur frothy odor of the hawthorn and plum blossom, and the pale gold odor to kiss me at the gate. It was strange to reach the marble steps and find no stir of bright dresses in and out of the door, and hear no sound but bird voices in the trees. And in spite, as we wandered through Marie Antoinette's music rooms and restoration salons, I felt that there were guests concealed behind every couch and table, under orders to be breathlessly silent until we had passed through. As Gatsby closed the door of the Merton College Library, I could have sworn I heard the owl-eyed man break into ghostly laughter. 
We went upstairs to the period bedrooms, and swathed in rows, and lavender silk, and vivid with new flowers through the dressing rooms, and pool rooms, and bathrooms, with sunken baths introduced intruding into one chamber where a disheveled man in pajamas was doing liver exercises on the floor. It was Mr. Clip Springer, the boarder I had seen him, wandering hungrily about the beach that morning. Finally, he came to Gatsby's own apartment, a bedroom and a bath, and an atom study where we sat down and drank a glass of some chaucheries he took from a cupboard in the wall. He hadn't once concealed. He hadn't once ceased looking at Daisy. I think he reevaluated. He reevaluated everything. He revalued everything in his house according to the measures of response it drew from the well-loved eyes. Sometimes too, he stared around at his position in a dazed way, as though in her actual and astounding presence, none of it was any longer real. Once, he nearly toppled down a flight of stairs. More water. Oh, thank you. His bedroom was the simplest room, all ex of all, except that where the dear dresser was garnished with a toilet seat set of pure dull gold, Daisy took the brush with delight and smoothed her hair, whereupon Gatsby sat down and shaded his eyes and began to laugh. It's the funniest thing, old sport, he said hilariously. I, I can't when I try to. He had passed visibly through two states and was entering upon a third. After his embarrassment and his unreasoning joy, he was consumed with wonder at her presence. He had been full of the idea so long, dreamed it right through to the end, waited with his teeth set, so to speak, at inconceivable pitch of intensity. Now, in the reaction, he was running down like an overwound clock, recovering himself in a minute. He opened for us two hulking patent cabinets, which had his masked suits and dressing gowns and ties and his skirt and his shirts piled like brickets in stands of dozens high. I've got a man in England who buys me clothes. He sends over a selection of things at the beginning of each season, springs and falls. He took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them one by one before us, shirts of a sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel, which lost their folds as they fell and covered the table in many colored disarray while he admired while he admired he brought more of the soft rich heap mounted higher shirts with stripes and scrolls and pla pa plaids and corals and apple green and lavender and faint orange with monograms of indian blue suddenly with a strange sound daisy bent her head into the shirt and began to cry stormily they're such beautiful shirts, she sobbed, her voice muffled in the thick folds. It makes me sad because I've never seen such beautiful shirts before. After the house, we were to see the grounds and the swimming pool and the hydroplane and the midsummer flowers. But outside Gatsby's window, it began to rain again. So we stood in a row, looking in the courtyard, in the, cor in the corrugated surface of the sound. If it wasn't for the mist, we could see you home across the bay, said Gatsby. You always have a green light that burns all night at the end of your dock. Daisy put her arm through this his abruptly, but he seemed absorbed in what he had been he had just said. Possibly it occurred to him that the colossal significance of the light had now vanished forever. Compared to the great distance that had separated him from Daisy, it had seemed very near to her, almost touching her. It had seemed as it had seemed as close as a star to the moon. Now it was again a green light on a dock. His count of enchanted objects had diminished by one. I began to walk about the room, examining various indefinite objects in the half-darkness. A large photograph of an elderly man in 
yachting costume attracted me, hung on the wall over his desk. Who's this? That? Uh, that's Mr. Dan Cody, old sport. The name sounded famil faintly familiar. He's dead now. He used to be my best friend years ago. There was a small picture of Gatsby, also in yachting costume, on the bureau. Gatsby, with his head thrown back death defiantly, taken apparently when he was about eighteen. I adore it, exclaimed Daisy. The, po the pompadour. You never told me you had a pompadour or a yacht. Look at this, said Gatsby. Here's a lot of clippings about you. They stood side by side examining it. I was going to ask to see the rubies, and the phone rang, and Gatsby took up the receiver. Uh, yes? W well, I can't talk now. I can't talk now. O old sport. Uh, I said a small town. He must know what a small town is. Well, he's no use to us if Detroit is his idea of a small town. He ra he, ha he rang off. Come here, quick, cried Daisy at the window. The rain was still falling, but the darkness had parted in the west, and there was a pink and golden billow of foamy clouds above the sea. Look at that, she whispered, and then after a moment, I'd like to just get one of those pink clouds and put you in it and push you around. I tried to go then, but they couldn't hear it. Perhaps my presence made me feel more satisfactorily alone. I know what we'll do, said Gatsby. We'll have Klippenspringer play the piano. He went out of the room calling, Ewing! And returned in a few minutes accompanied by an embarrassed, slightly worn young man with shell-rimmed glasses and a scantily blonde hair. He was now decently clothed in, sport sh in a sport shirt, open at the neck, sneakers and a duck trousers of a nebulous hue. Did, did we interrupt your exercises? inquired Daisy politely. I was asleep, cried Clip Springer, in a spasm of embarrassment. That is, I'd been asleep. Uh, then I got up. Clip Springer, play the piano, said Gatsby, cutting him off. Don't you, ewing, don't you, ewing, old sport? I don't play well. I don't. I hardly play at all. I'm all out of a uh, prac. We'll go upstairs, interrupted Gatsby. He flipped a switch. Then the gray windows disappeared as the house glowed full of light. In the music room, Gatsby turned on a solitary lamp beside the piano. He lit Daisy's cigarette from a trembling match and sat down with her on a couch far beyond the room, where there was no light save what the gleaming floor bounced in front of the hall. When Klippensbringer had played The Love Nest, he turned around on the bench and searched unhappily for Gatsby in the gloom. Am I all out of practice, you see? I told you I couldn't play. I'm all out of practice. Don't talk so much, old sport, commanded Gatsby. Play. In the morning, in the evening, ain't we got fun? Outside the wind was loud and there was a faint flow of thunder along the sound. All the lights were going on the west egg now. The electric trains men carrying were plunging home through the rain through New York. It was the hour of a profound human change and excitement was generating on the air. One thing sure and nothing sure, the rich get rich and the poor get children. In the meantime, in the between time, as I went over to say goodbye, I saw that the expression of bewilderment had come back to Gatsby's face, as though a faint doubt had occurred to him as to the quality of his present happiness. Almost five years. There must have been moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. He had thrown himself into it with a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with ever brighter feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man will store up in his ghostly heart. As I watched him, he adjourned himself a little vi visibly. His hand took hold of hers and as she said something low in his ear, he turned toward her with a rush of emotion. I think that voice held him the most, with its fluctuating, feverish warmth, because it couldn't be overdreamt. That voice was a deathless song. They had forgotten me. But Daisy glanced up and held out her hand. Gatsby didn't know me now at all. I looked once more at them, and they looked back at me. 
remotely possessed by intense life. Then I went out of the room and down the marble steps into the rain, leaving them there together. And that is the end of chapter five. Dear readers, if I am being quite frank, my throat is starting to hurt. Oh, hello there! I'm sorry, I was sniffing some glue, but you know what you should do? Read The Great Gatsby 2! The Great Gatsby 2, Chapter 3. The Great Gatsby 2 was looking at the green light from Nick's house. He got so into it, he accidentally walked into the lake. Nick saw all of this and laughed so much, he pissed himself. She stuffed the bag right out in the middle of the aisle, where the conductor and everybody can trip over it. Women. I just like them. I mean, they're always leaving their goddamn bags out in the middle of the aisle. Excuse me, but isn't that a Pensy Prep sticker? Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, how lovely. Perhaps you know my son then, Ernest Morrow? He goes to Pensy. Yes, I do. He's in my class. Her son is doubtless the biggest bastard that ever went to Pensy in the whole crummy history of the school. He was always going around snapping his wet, soggy towel at people's asses. That's exactly the kind of guy he was. Oh, how nice. I must tell Ernest we met. May I ask your name, dear? Rudolf Schmidt. I don't feel like giving her my whole life history. Rudolf Schmidt was the name of our janitor. Do you like Pensy? Pensy? It's not too bad. It's not paradise or anything, but it's as good as most schools. Some of the faculty are very conscientious. Ernest just adores it. I know he does. He really knows how to adapt himself. He really does. He really knows how to adapt himself. Oh, do you really think so? Ernest? Sure. I just broke my nail getting out of a cab. She has a terrifically nice smile. She really does. Most people have hardly any smile at all, or a lousy one. Ernest's father and I sometimes worry about him. He's not a great mixer. How do you mean? Well, he's a very sensitive boy. He's never really been too great of a mixer with other boys. Maybe it's just because he takes things a little bit more too seriously at his age. Sensitive? <laughs> that kills me. That guy Moreau is about as sensitive as a goddamn toilet seat. I mean, she doesn't look like a dope or anything. She looks like she might have a pretty good idea of what a bastard she was that mother of. But you can't always tell with somebody's mother. I mean, mothers are all slightly insane. The thing is, though, I like old Moreau's mother. She's alright. I'm beginning to feel guilty I told her my name was Rudolf Schmidt. Old Ernie, he's one of the most popular kids at Pensy. Did you know that? No, I didn't. It really took everybody quite a long time to get to know him. He's a funny guy, a strange guy in a lot of ways. Know what I mean? Like, when I first met him, when I first met him, I thought he was kind of a snobbish person. That's what I thought. But he isn't. He's just got this very original personality that takes you a little while to get to know him. Did he tell you about the elections? 
the class elections. No. Well, a bunch of us wanted old learning to be president of the class. I mean, he was the unanimous choice. I mean, he was the only boy that could really handle the job. But this other boy, Harry Fencer, was elected. And the reason he was elected, the simple and obvious reason, was because Ernie wouldn't let us nominate him. Because he's so darn shy and modest and all. He refused. Boy, is he really shy. You ought to make him try and get over that. Did he tell you about it? No, he didn't. That's Ernie. He wouldn't. That's the one fault with him. He's too shy and modest. You really ought to get him to try and relax occasionally. You take a guy like Moreau, that's always snapping their towels at people's asses, really trying to hurt someone, they don't just stay a rat while they're a kid. They stay a rat their whole life. But I'll bet after all the crap I shot, Miss Morrow will keep thinking of him now as this very shy, modest guy that wouldn't let us nominate him for president. She might. You can't tell with mothers. They aren't too sharp about that stuff. Ernest wrote that he'd be home on Wednesday. That Christmas break would start on Wednesday. I hope you didn't get called home early because of an illness in the family. No. Everybody's fine at home. See, it's me. I have to have this operation. Oh. I'm so sorry. It isn't very serious. I have this tiny little tumor on the brain. Oh, I'll be all right in everything. It's a very tiny one, right near the outside. Well, good luck with the surgery, Rudolph. I hope everything goes okay. And if you ever want to hang out with Ernest, we have a house in Massachusetts with a beach and a tennis court. Oh, that's okay. I'm going to South America to visit my grandmother. Oh, okay. Well, it was very nice meeting you, Rudolph. Mm He's too shy and modest. You really ought to get him to try to relax occasionally. I felt that on the table. We're not done, Taylor. <laughs> well, th that's a good... Th what do you mean we're not done? That concludes part three from our reading of The Great Gatsby One. Tune in again at midnight for part four. Fitzgerald II, author of The Great Gatsby II, and you are watching The Dead Sullivan Graveyard Shift. Stop! And read The Great Gatsby II! Why don't you? 
F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby 2, Chapter 4. The eyes of T.J. Ecclesburg were looking at everyone. Oh, shit, are you looking at me? said The Great Gatsby 2. Oh, yeah, sorry, is that okay? said The Eyes of Dr. T.J. Ecclesburg. I guess, said The Great Gatsby 2. And he took a huge ball rip. Then Tom was there and said something racist, probably. And now, a reading of part four of The Great Gatsby One.
And now we return to our regularly scheduled programming. Les Fleurs de Mal de Charles Baudelaire. Lecture. La sottise, l'erreur, la pêche, la lessine occupaient nos esprits et travaillant du corps. Et nous alimenterons nos amables les morts. Comme les mondéons ne descendent, les vermines. Nos péchés sont têtus, nos repentirs sont lâchés. Nous, nous faisons payer, grassement nos évus. Et nous rentrons gaiement dans les chemin pour le Croyons pas des villes plaisent, lever toutes nos trachées. Seul les oreillers. Dommage, c'est Satan trismégiste qui berce longuement neutre notre esprit enchanté et les riches métals de notre volonté. Es-tu vaporisé par ces savants chimistes C'est le diable qui tient les filles qui nous remontent. Ô objet répugnant, nous trouvons des appas. Chaque jour, vers l'enfer, nous descendons d'une part. Sans horreur, à travers des ténébreuses qui pions. Ainsi qu'une débauchée pauvre qui baisse et mange les scènes martyrisées d'une antique catan. Nous voulons au passage une place clandestine qui nous pressent bien forte. Comme une vue orange, serait fourmillant comme un million terminé dans le serveur reporté une peuple de démons. Et quand nous respirons, les morts dans nos poumons descendent, fluides invisibles, avec des sauts des plantés. Si les viols, les poissons, les poignards, l'incendie, non pas encore brodé de le plaisant dessin, le canevas banal de nos petits destins, c'est que notre armée, hélas, n'est pas assez radie. Mais parmi les chacals, les panthères, les lycées, les songes, les scorpions, les voitures, les serpents, les monstres glapissants, eulants, grognants, rampants, dans les ménageries enflammées de nos vices, il est néant plus laid, plus méchant, plus aimant. Croire qu'il n'est pas, n'est plus, n'est grand gestes, n'est grand cris. Il ferait volontiers de la terre un débris, et dans un bel monde, avélerait le monde. C'est l'ennui, le roi, charge d'un plus involontaire, et rêve d'échafaud en fumant son huka. Tu le connais, lecteur, ce monstre délicat. Hypocrite, lecteur, mon semblable, mon semblable, mon frère. Bénédiction. Lorsque, par un décret de puissance suprême, le poète apparaît en ce monde ennuyé, sa mère épouvantée et plein de blasphèmes. Crisp se prend vers Dieu, qui les prend en pitié. Ah, qui ne jamais mis battu en nuée de vipères. Plutôt qui n'aurait cette direction. Maudité soit la nuit de plaisir éphémère, eu mon ventre, conçu mon expiation. Presque. Tu m'as choisi entre tous les femmes pour être le dégoût de mon triste mari et que je ne puis pas rejeter dans les flammes. Comme mon billet de mort, ce monstre d'abugré, je ferai rejaillir ta haine qui m'accable. Sur l'instrument maudit de tes méconnaîtres, et je trouverai si bien ces arbres misérables qu'il ne pourra pousser ces boitons 
en pestez. El Raval, ainsi le cum de Sahan, et ne comprenait pas les déciences éternelles, et même préparait au fond de la Guinée, les bouches sont consacrées au crime éternel. Pourtant, sur le tutelle invisible d'un âge, l'enfant déshéritait son énervé de soleil, et dans tout ce qui boit, et dans tout ce qu'il mange, retrouver l'empruserie et le nectar vermeil. Il jouait avec le vent, cause avec le nuage, et célébrait en chantant du chemin de la croix, et l'esprit qui le suit dans son pèlerinage, pleure de le voir que, comme on eussu des bois, tout que qui vu Amel l'observant avec crainte, Ubian s'en radissant de son tranquillité, cherchant à qui sera lui tiré en pliante, et François lui laissait de leur férocité. Dans les pans et les vignes destinées à sa bouche, il mélange de la cambre avec d'une pure crochet, avec hypocrisie, et jetant ce qu'il touchait, et s'accusant de voir mis leurs pieds dans ses pas. Sa femme va criant sur les places publiques. Pousse qu'il me trouve assez belle promedeur. Je ferai le métier des idées antiques. Et comme elle, je veux me faire redorer. Et j'ai mis sur les redonats dans scène de mer, de genoflexions, de viandes et de vignes, pour savoir si j'ai pu. Alright, I gave you time. You gotta get out of here, Frenchy boy. I didn't want to read this anyway. Yeah, sure you didn't. Fucking French. You okay, Monsieur? I am perfectly fine. <laughs> Chapter 6 About this time, an ambitious young reporter from New York arrived one morning at Gatsby's door and asked him if he had anything to say. Anything to say about what? inquired Gatsby politely. Why any statement to give you? Why, any statement to give out? It transpired after con a confused five minutes that the man heard Gatsby's name around his office in a connection which he either wouldn't reveal or didn't fully understand. This was his day off, and with, <coughs> <coughs> and with laudable initiative, he had been hurried out to sea. It was a random shot, and yet the reporter's instincts was right. Gatsby's notoriety spread about by the hundreds who had accepted his hospitality, and so became authorities upon his past, and increased all summer until he fell just short of being news. Contemporary legends such as the underground pipeline to Canada attached themselves to him, and there was one persistent story that he didn't live in a house at all, but in a boat that looked like a house and was moved secretly up the de and down Long Island's shore. Why, just why these inventions were a source of satisfaction to James Gatz of North Dakota isn't easy to say. James Gatz, who was really, or at least legally his name, he had changed it at the age of seventeen at the specific moment that witnessed the beginning of his career, where he saw Dan Cody's yacht drop anchor over the most insidious flat on Lake Superior. It was James Gatz who had been loafing along the beach that afternoon in a torn green jersey and a pair of canvas pants, but it was already Jay Gatsby who borrowed a rowboat, pulled out to the turbulence, and informed Cody that a wind might catch him and break him up in a half an hour. 
I suppose he had the name ready for a long time, even then. His parents were shiftless and unsuccessful farm people, like imagination that had never really accepted them as his parents at all. The truth was that Jay Gatsby of West Egg, Long Island, sprang from this platonic conception of himself. He was a son of God, a phrase which, if it means anything, means just that, and he must be about his father's business, the service of a vast and vulgar and meretitious beauty. So we invented just the sort of Jay Gatsby that a 17-year-old boy would be likely to invent, and to his conception he was faithful to the end. For over a year he had been beating his way along the south shore of Lake Superior as a clam digger and a salmon fisher or in any other capacity that brought him food and bed, his brown hardened hardening body livid naturally through the half the fierce, half lazy work of the bracing day. He knew women early, and since they spoiled him, he became contemptuous of them, of young virgins because they were ignorant, of the others because they were hysterical about things which in his overwhelming self-absorption he took for granted. But his heart was in a constant turbulent riot. The most grotesque and fantastic conceits haunted him in his bed at night, a universe of infallible guardians got of gaudiness spun itself out in his brain while the clock ticked on the waist the weight of the wastened and the moon soaked with wet light his tangled clothes upon the floor each night he added to the pastern the pattern of his fancies until drowsiness closed down upon some vivid scene with an obvious embrace for a while, the rever rever reveries provided an outlet for his imagination. They were a satisfactory hint of the unreality of reality, a promise that the rock of the world was founded securely on a fairy's wing. An instant towered his future glory. He told him some months before to a small Lutheran college of St. Olaf's in southern Minnesota. He stayed... They are two weeks dismayed at its ferocious indifference, the drums of his destiny, to destiny itself, and despising the janitor's work with which he has to pay his way through. Then he drifted back to Lake Superior, and he was still searching for something to do on the day the Dan Cody's yacht dropped anchor in the shallows along shore. Water. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Cody. We love you in this crazy establishment. Thank you. Cody was 15 years old then, a product of the Nevada silver yields of the Yukon, of every rush of for, for, for metals since 75, the transactions in Montana copper that made him many times a millionaire, found him physically robust but on the verge of the soft-mindedness and suspecting this an infinite number of women tried to separate him from his money. The none-too-savory ramifications by which Ella Kane, the newspaper woman, played Madame de Matinee to his weakness and sent him to sea in a yacht were common knowledge to the turgid tur sub or suppressed journalism of 1902. He had been coasting along all two hospitable shores for five years when he turned up to Jane Gatz's des destiny in Little Girl Bay, to young Gatz resenting on his oars and looking up at the railroad deck the yacht represented all the beauty and glamour in the world. I suppose he smiled at Cody. He had probably discovered that people liked him when he smiled. At any rate, Cody asked him a few questions. One of them elicited the brand new name. And found that he was quick and extravagantly ambitious. A few days later, he looked 
he took up him to Duluth, and brought him a blue coat, six pairs of white duck trousers, and a yachting cap. And when the Trulumont left at the West Indies and the Barbary Coast, Gatsby left too. He was employed in a vague personality, personal capacity while he remained with Cody. He was in turn steward mate, skipper secretary, and even jailer for Dan Cody sober. Knew what lavish doings Dan Cody drew. drunk might soon be about, and he provided for such contingencies by reposing more and more trust in Gatsby. The arrangement lasted five years, during which the boats were three times around the continent. It might have lasted indefinitely, except for the fact that Ella Kane came up on board one night in Boston, and a week later Dan Cody inhospitably died. I remember the portrait of him in Gatsby's bedroom, a gray, florid man with a ha hard, empty face, the pioneer debauchee who, during one phase of American life, brought back to the eastern seaboard the savage violence of the frontier brothel and saloon. It was indirectly due to Cody that Gatsby drank so little. Sometimes, in the course of gay parties, women used to rub champagne into his hair. For himself, he forms the habit of letting, li li letting liquor alone. And it was from Cody that he inherited money, a legacy of $25,000. He didn't get it. He never understood the legal device that was used against him. But what remained of the millionaire went intact to Ellen K Ella Kane. He was left with his singularly appropriate education. The vague counter of Jake Gatsby had filled out to the substantially, su to the substantially of a man. He told me all this very much later, but I've been in. T I put it down here with the idea of exploding those first wild rumors about his attendance, which weren't even fairly true. Moreover, he told it to me at a time of confusion, when I had reached the point of believing everything and nothing about him. So I take advantage of this short halt, while Gatsby, so to speak, caught his breath to clear this set of misconceptions away. It was a halt, too. In my association with this affair, for several weeks I didn't see him or hear his voice on the phone, Mostly, I was in New York, trotting around with Jordan, and trying to ingratiate myself with her senile aunt. But finally, I went over to his house one Sunday afternoon. I hadn't been there two minutes when somebody brought Tom Buchanan in for a drink. I started... I stare startled naturally, but the really surprising thing was that it hadn't happened before. There were a party of three on horseback, Tom and a man named Sal Salone, and a pretty woman in a brown riding habit, who had been there previously. I'm delighted to see you, said Gatsby, standing on his porch. I'm delighted that you dropped in. As though they cared. Sit right down, have a cigarette or a cigar. He walked around the room, quickly ringing bells. I have something to drink for you in just a minute. He was profoundly affected by the fact that Tom was there, but he would be uneasy anyhow until he had given them something, realizing in a vague way that he was all they came for. Mr. Sloan wanted nothing. A lemonade? No thanks. A little champagne? Nothing at all, thanks. I'm sorry. Did you have a nice ride? Very good roads around here. I suppose the automobiles... Yeah. Moved by an irresistible impulse, Gatsby turned to Tom, who had accepted the introduction as a stranger. I believe we've met somewhat before, Mr. Buchanan. Oh, yes, said Tom, gruffly, polite, but obviously not remembering. So we did. I remember very well. About two weeks ago. That's right. You were with Nick here. I know your wife, continued Gatsby, almost aggressively. That so? Tom turned to me. You live near here, Nick. Next door. That so? Mr. Sloan didn't enter in the conversation, but lounged back haughtily in his chair. 
The woman said nothing either, until unexpectedly, after two highballs, she became cordial. We'll all come over to your next party, Mr. Gatsby, she suggested. What do you say? Certainly, I'd be delighted to have you. Be ver nice, said Mr. Sloan, without gratitude. Well, think ought to be slattering home. Please don't hurry, Gatsby urged. We had control of him. Le he had control of himself now, and he wanted to see more of Tom. Why don't you? Why don't you stay for supper? I wouldn't be surprised if some other people dropped in from New York. You come to supper with me, said the lady enthusiastically. Both of you. This includes me, Mr. Sloan. This includes me, Mr. Sloan got to his... This included me. Mr. Sloan got to his feet. Come along, he said, but to her only. I mean it, she insisted. I'd love to have you. Lots of room. Gatsby looked at her, at me questioningly. He wanted to go, and he didn't see that Mr. Sloan had determined he shouldn't. I'm afraid I won't be able to, I said. Well, you come, she urged, concentrating on Gatsby. Mr. Sloan murmured something close to her ear. We won't be late if we start now, she insisted aloud. I haven't got a horse, said Gatsby. I used to ride in the army, but I never brought a horse. I'll have to follow you in my car. Excuse me for just a minute. The rest of us walked out of the porch, onto the porch, where Sloane and the lady began to impassioned conversation aside. My God, I believe the man's coming, said Tom. Doesn't he... Doesn't he know she doesn't want him? She always says she does want him. She has a big dinner party, and he won't know a soul there, he frowned. I wonder where in the devil he met Daisy. But God, I may be old-fashioned in my ideas, but women run around too much these days to suit me. They meet all kinds of crazy fish. Suddenly, Mr. Sloan and the lady walked down the steps and mounted their horses. Come on, said Mr. Sloan to Tom. We're late. We've got to go. And then to me, tell him we couldn't wait, will you? Tom and I shook hands, and the rest of us exchanged a cool and they trotted quickly down a cool nod, and they trotted quickly down to drive, disappearing under the August foliage, just as Gatsby with that with hat and light overcoat in hand came out the front door. Tom was evidently perturbed at Daisy, running around home for her, running around alone, for on the following Saturday night he came with her to Gatsby's party. Perhaps his presence gave the evening its peculiar quality of oppressiveness. It stands out in my memory from Gatsby's other parties that summer. There were the same people, or at least the same sort of people, the same profession of champagne, the same many-colored, many-keyed con commotion. But I felt an unpleasantness in the air, or pervading harshness that hadn't been there before. Or perhaps I'd merely grown used to it, grown to accept West Egg as a sort of complete wor of a, as a world complete in itself, with its own standards and its own great figures, second to nothing because it had no consciousness of being so, and now I was looking at it again through Daisy's eyes. It is invariably saddening to look through new eyes at things upon which you have expected your own powers of, adju of, of adjustment. They arrived at twilight, and as we strolled out among the spar-killing hundreds, Daisy's voice was playing murmurous tricks in her throat. These ex things excite me so, she whispered. If you want to kiss me any time during the evening, Nick, just let me know, and I'll be glad to arrange it for you. Just mention my name, or present a green card. I'm giving out green. Look around, suggested Gatsby. I'm looking around. I'm having a marvelous... You must see the faces of many people you've heard about. We don't go around very much, he said. In fact, I was just thinking I don't know a soul here. Perhaps you know that lady, Gatsby indicated a gorgeous scarcely human orchard of a woman who in state under a white plume tree tom and daisy stared and with that particularly unreal feeling 
that accompanied the right the recognition of hitherto ghostly celebrity of the movies. She's lovely, said Daisy. The man bending over her in her direction in her director. He took them ceremoniously from group to group. Mr. Mrs. Buchanan and Mr. Buchanan. And after an instant's hesitation, he added, the polo player. Oh, no, objected Tom quickly. Not me. But evidently the sound of it pleased Gatsby, for Tom remained the polo player for the rest of the evening. I've never met so many celebrities, Daisy exclaimed. I liked that man, what was his name, uh, with the sort of blue nose. Gatsby identified him, adding that he was a small producer. Well, I liked him anyhow. I'd a little rather not be the polo player. I'd a little rather not be the polo player, said Tom pleasantly. I'd rather look at all these famous people in, in, obliv in, in oblivion. Daisy and Gatsby danced. I remember being surprised by his graceful, conservative foxtrot. I had never seen him dance before. Then they saunter over to my house and sat on the steps for half an hour, while at her request I remained watchful in the garden. In case there's a fire or a flood, she explained, or any act of God. Tom appeared from his oblivion as we were sitting down to su supper together. Do you mind if I eat with some people over here? he said. A fellow's getting off a fellow is getting off some funny stuff. Go ahead, answered Daisy genuinely. And if you want to take down my address, here's my little gold pencil. She looked around after a moment and told me the girl was common but pretty. And after a moment after a moment and told me the girl was common but pretty pretty, and I knew that, except for the half-hour she had been alone with Gatsby, she wasn't having a good time. We were at a particularly tipsy table. That was all my fault. Gatsby had been called to the phone, and I enjoyed these same people only two weeks before. But what had amused me then turns skeptic on the air now. How do you feel, Miss Bakadir? The girl addressed addressed was trying unsuccessfully to slump against my shoulder. At this inquiry, she sat up and opened her eyes. What? A massive, lethargic woman who had been urging Daisy to play golf with her at the local club tomorrow spoke in Miss, Be in M Miss Bakerton's defense. Oh, she's all right now. When she's had five or six cocktails, he always starts screaming like that. I tell her she ought to leave it alone. I do leave it alone, affirmed the accused Howley. Howl, Howl, Howley? We had heard you yelling, so I said to Doc Civet here, There's somebody that needs your help, Doc. She's much obliged, I'm sure, said another friend, without gratitude. But you got her dress all wet, and you stuck her head in the pool. Anything I hate is to get my head stuck in a pool, mumbled Miss Beckadier. They almost drowned me o once over in New Jersey. Then you ought to leave it alone, countered Dr. Civet. Speak for yourself, said Mrs. Baker, Bacadier violently. Your hand shakes. I won't let you operate on me. It was like that. Almost the last thing I remember was standing with Daisy and watching the moving di picture director and his star. They still under the white plume tree and their white faces were touching except for pale, thin ray moonlight between. It occurred to me that he had been very slowly bending toward her all evening to attain this proximity, and even while I watched, I saw him stoop one ultimate degree and a kiss at her cheek. I like her, said Daisy. I think she's lovely. But the rest offended her and inarguably because it wasn't a gesture, but an emotion. She was appalled by West Egg, this 
unprecedented place that Broadway had begotten upon a Long Island fishing village, appalled by its raw vigor and chafed under the old euphemisms and by the too obstructive fate that herded its inhabitants along a shortcut from nothing to nothing. She saw something awful in the very simplicity she failed to understand. I sat on the front steps with them while they waited for their car. It was dark here in front. Only the bright door set ten square feet of light volleying out into the soft black morning. Sometimes a shadow moved against the dressing room, but blind above gave way to another shadow, an indefinite procession of shadows that rogue and powdered in an invisible glass. Who is this Gatsby, anyhow? he demanded suddenly. Some big bootlegger? Where'd you hear that? I inquired. I didn't hear it. I imagined it. A lot of these newly rich people are just big bootleggers, you know. Not Gatsby, I said shortly. He was silent for a moment. The pebbles on the drive crunched under his feet. Well, he certainly must have strained himself to get this, man this menagerie together. A breeze stirred the gray, the gray haze of Daisy's fur collar. At least they're more interesting than the people we know, she said with an effort. You didn't look so interested. Well, I was. Tom laughed and turned to me. Did you notice Daisy's face when the girl asked her to put her under a cold shower? Daisy began to swig with the music in a husky, rhythmic whisper, bringing out a meaning in each word that had never had before and would never have again. When the melody rose, her voice broke up sweetly, following in in a way contralo voices have, and each change tipped out a little of her warm human magic upon the air. Lots of people come who have been invited, she said suddenly. That girl hadn't been invited. They simply force their way in, and he's too polite to object. I'd like to know who he is and what he does, insisted Tom. And I think I'll make a point of finding out. I can tell you right now, she answered. He owns some drugstore, a lot of drugstores. He built them up by himself. The diolatry limousine came rolling up the drive. Good night, Nick, said Daisy. Her glance left me and sought the lingered tops of the steps. We're three o'clock in the morning, a neat, sad, and little waltz of, the, of that year was drifting out the open door, after all, in the very costless of the Gatsby party, and were romantic possibilities totally absent from her world. What, what was it up there in the song that seemed to be calling her back inside? What would happen now in the dim, incalculable hours? Perhaps some unbelievable guest would arrive, a person infinitely rare and to be marveled at, and some authentically radiant young girl who, with one fresh glance at Gatsby, one movement of magical encounter, would blot out those five years of unwavering devotion. I stayed late that night, Gatsby asked me to visit until he was free, and I lingered in the garden until the inevitable swimming party had run up, chilled and exalted. From the, bat, from the black beach, until the lights were extinguished in the guest rooms overhead. When he came down the steps at last, the tan skin, the drawn, unusually light of his face, and his eyes were bright and tired. She didn't like it, he said immediately. Of course she did. She didn't like it, he insisted. She didn't have a good time. He was silent, and I guessed his unutterable, unutterable depression. I feel far away from her, he said. It's hard to make her understand. You mean, about the dance? The dance? He dismissed all the dances he had given with a snap of his finger. Old sport, the dance is unimportant. He wanted nothing less of Daisy than that she should go to Tom and say, I never loved you. After she had obligated four years with that sentence, after she had obliterated four years with that sentence, they could decide upon the most practical measures to be taken. One of them was that, after she was free, they were to go back to Louisville and be married from her ha her house, just as if it were five years ago. And she didn't doesn't understand, he said. She used to be able to understand. We'd sit for hours. He 
He broke off and began to walk up and down a desolate path of fruit rinds and discarded flavors and crushed flowers. I wouldn't ask too much of her, I ventured. You can't repeat the past. Can't repeat the past, he cried incredulously. Why, of course you can. He looked around him wildly, as if the past were lurking here in the shadows of his house, just out of reach of his hand. I'm going to fix everything, just the way it was before, he said, nodding determinately. She'll see. He talked a lot about the past, and I gathered that he wanted to recover something, some idea of himself, perhaps, that he had gone into loving Daisy. His life had been confused and disordered since then, but if he had could once return to a certain starting place and go over it all slowly, he could find out what that thing was. One autumn night, five years ago, they had been walking down the street when the leaves were falling, and they came to a place where there were no trees and the sidewalk was white with moonlight. They stopped here and turned toward each other. Now it was a cool night, with a mysterious excitement in it, with which comes at the two changes of the year. The quiet light of his house were humming out into the darkness, and there was a stir and the bustle among the stars. Out of the corner of his eye, Gatsby saw that the blocks of the sidewalks really formed a ladder and, the mount and mounted to a secret place above the tree. He could climb it, too, if he climbed alone, and once there he could s suck on the pap of life, gulp down the incorrible milk of wonder. His eyes beat faster and faster as Daisy's white face came up to his own. He knew that when he kissed this girl and forever wed his utter, his unutterable vision to her perishable breath, his mind would never romp again like the mind of God. So he waited, listening for a moment, longer to the turning fork that he had been struck upon a star. Then he kissed her. At his lips, touch she blossomed for him like a flower and the incarnation was complete though all he said even though his appalling sentimentality i was reminded of something an elusive rhythm a fragment of lost words that i had heard somewhere a long time ago for a moment a phrase tried to take shape in my mouth and my lips parted like a dumb man's, as though there was more struggling upon them than a wisp of startled air. But they made no sound, and what I had almost remembered was uncommunicable forever. And that is the end of chapter 6. Madam, can I confide in you for a sec? Yes. I don't think I can continue tonight. That's fair. Shall we pick it up some other time? I think we should pick it up tomorrow. Beautiful. Okay. Dear readers, we will pick this up in the morrow. Good night.
Yeah, and your question was to just kind of tell you about myself and the movie. Yeah, just uh, like uh, what's your uh, what's your background? Uh, how did you uh, conceive of this project? Uh, how did this all get started? I started out wanting to be a cartoonist and kind of evolved from cartooning to storyboarding to filmmaking. And now um, I work full time as a freelance producer, director and uh, director of photography. Monster Force Zero was a, a project that Megan McGrath uh, brought me on and to direct. Um, she was tapped by Mike Pasito, our executive producer who wrote it. Um, he was uh, motivated. One, two, buckle my shoe. It's The Great Gatsby 2, the newest book from Dead Sullivan Productions. Read it, the next great American novel. Mrs. Maisel, too. Try something new. Chapter five! But, like, page three, so, yeah. The Great Gatsby 2 was having a party. Daisy saw The Great Gatsby 2 and went up to say hi. Hello, The Great Gatsby, said Daisy. Actually, I am The Great Gatsby 2, said The Great Gatsby 2. Well, that makes sense, because the first one is dead, said Daisy. Right, said the great Gatsby, too. Exactly. That's it. That's all. That's... Something needs to happen in this book. Something, we need a plot, we need characters. I, something's gotta happen. <laughs> when I started the series, I thought that the book was the joke, but I'm starting to think that I'm the joke. <laughs> I sit up, my neck is strained, my pumpkin head's too heavy and my joints are in pain, but the real pain is what I see when everybody's looking at me, the stares, the glares, I mean who even cares to respect a freak like me, I want somebody to understand what it's like to be a pumpkin headed man, but nobody, nobody listens to me. I'm a pumpkin-headed creep. Hello, and welcome to the Dead Sullivan interview series. Today, we have the privilege of talking with the F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, two. Two, that's correct, yes. Uh, I, yeah, two, okay. Um, well, Mr. Fitzgerald, two, it is an honor to be here. Thank you, and it's with, an honor to be here with you, with you too, uh, Mr. Thank Ethan you. Black. The Dead Sullivan interview series. Very, very prestigious I show. I am a huge fan of your father, originator's work. It's, uh, it's not Gatsby. important. Uh, okay. Uh, um, Ed well, Scott Fitzgerald, he was a man. He existed. He lived. He died. He loved. He's yes. dead now. I'm Ed Scott Fitzgerald, too. He wrote The Great Gatsby 1. It's an excellent book. I wrote The Great Gatsby 2. I think you'll agree it's much better. I, yes. <laughs> I find myself torn. I like them both for very different reasons. Fair enough, fair enough. See, F. F Scott Fitzgerald the first, F. Scott Fitzgerald one, he died with no money. Mm -hmm. He's an alcoholic. His marriage destroyed. His life ended. He was only hanging out with circus freaks. Now I'm a successful man. What does that tell you? Circus freaks. It tells me that life is worth living and more life is good. And circus freaks. And, and, and circus freaks. They're important. Sure. Important part of the writing process. Uh, how so? See, most people, most people who aren't writers, people who aren't writers, they don't know. There's a lot of things they don't know. They only have a frame of reference for a certain, certain level of human experiences. They go about their lives, they're sad, pathetic, 
regular lives as normal people. They do normal things. They go to an office, or they go to a parking garage, or they go to a mall. No, an author, a writer, a writer's job is to get the full spectrum of human experience that they may write. That's where circus freaks come in. You have to go to the circus. You have to know what it's like to be a, a, a bearded woman or someone who bites the heads off of chickens. Uh, a geek, I believe. A geek, yes, exactly. That is the function of a writer. I see. I, you know, I remember uh, reading from you that, or your, your predecessor, that New York and, but by extension, uh, Hollywood was a mecca for material. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You run into all sorts of people. Circus freaks. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Um, I imagine that every person, every character, every uh, comp uh, component of the DSM-5 is in many ways just another circus freak. Absolutely, absolutely. Everyone in their life. Everyone, in their own way, is a bit of a circus freak. Writers, most of all. I see. The writer, if you will, is the ringmaster of the circus freaks. Absolutely, absolutely. A writer is a ringmaster in the sense that they have the control, they have the power to take, take all of these circus freaks and put them in order, on the page, yes. in words. Brilliant. Brilliant. I, I never thought of it that way. Yes, a writer must do heroin. Who, who is the lion? Who is the lion? Who is the lion? Well, the lion, the lion in this book, The Great Gatsby 2, ah. this is my most recent novel, the lion in this book um, would be, uh, I, I believe, the wizard. The ah. wizard who, who makes it his mission to kill Tom Buchanan. Mm. Um, the witch and the wardrobe. The witch and the wardrobe, yes. There is no witches or wardrobes in this book, but mm. maybe there should have been. Maybe there should have been. Maybe there should have been. I recognize that was an allusion to, to C.S. Lewis. Ah, uh, yes. Protestant. He, I, I would never have known. <laughs> I would just like to check on something. Okay, good. Everything's in order? Everything is in order. As, as we were. Right, right. Well, as I was telling my friend Ernest Hemingway, too, Yes. Yes, er er Ernest Hemingway 2. He's the sequel to Ernest Hemingway. He's got a new book coming out. Ah. He, he does. Um, has he told you the title? He, he has told me the title, but I, I, I won't reveal it yet. Okay, well... In time, we will know what Ernest Hemingway 2 has been working on. I, I look forward to hearing about it. And I'm, I'm sure we will. Ernest Hemingway 2, as I was telling him... He's, he's an author who, he, he works at a somewhat different school mm -hmm. from myself. He's not so much concerned with, with heroin and, and circus freaks. See, he lives in, he lives in France. Ah. And the French writers, all they do is fuck. Yes. All they care about is pussy. Mm -hmm. Something to consider. There is something to consider. Uh, especially if one... If a man does not have the faculties to engage with the um, the pussy, now that's an that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. What happens then? I what if he were to say go on a road trip to Spain, mm -hmm. but he couldn't fuck pussy? What would he do then? I I believe fight bulls. I I believe he doesn't even have to fight the bull. I believe he has to watch another man fight the bull, and that reinvigorates his masculinity. See, isn't that a metaphor in itself? He can't fight the bulls himself, he can't fuck the pussy. Mm -hmm. He can only watch. Yes. Or perhaps he can only write about it. Perhaps. Ernest Hemingway too, what a cuck. What a cuck, indeed. Um, I'd also say that in many ways, isn't just the matador and the bull and the whole ring, are they not all a circus? Are they not all a pussy? Yes, yes, uh, 
I- indeed. What is the job of the metaphor? It's to, to penetrate the bull. Penetrate, get through the bullshit. Now we're talking. Yes. Um, I did have the pleasure of reading The Great Gatsby 2, and um, our, our viewers will in time uh, get the privilege of hearing me uh, read it. Ah. But it did uh, raise a few questions. Yes. Um, firstly, what was the inspiration for The Great Gatsby 2? Well, the inspiration for The Great Gatsby 2, the, uh, the primary inspiration was, of course, The Great Gatsby 1, by, by F. Scott Fitzgerald 1. Yes. And uh, I figured, him being F. Scott Fitzgerald 1, me being F. Scott Fitzgerald 2, well, it, it was only natural that I should write The Great Gatsby 2, just as he wrote The Great Gatsby 1. Mm. And um, I figured enough time had passed that um, we needed A Great Gatsby 2. There yes. hasn't been one. And so I began to, to look about my life, to look at circus freaks and pussy. Mm-hmm. And I, I am, you know, consumption of, of drugs mm-hmm. and substances of all kinds. Yes. And that's where the book came from. Well, that's as good as answer as any. Um, I had some further questions, but... I think they are best left for the readers when they hear the book or read the book for themselves. Certainly, certainly. I encourage everyone to read the book for themselves. It's readily available. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can find it in all bookstores. Every bookstore. Every bookstore. If a bookstore does not have a copy of The Great Gatsby 2, it's not a real bookstore. It's a money laundering scheme. Yes. You should report them to the authorities. If you walk into a bookstore and ask them for a copy of The Great Gatsby 2, and they don't know what you're talking about, call the police immediately. Hmm. Immediately. I will certainly do that. So, I know this might be a sensitive subject, but are you a clone? Am I a clone? Well, I do. I have experience with clones. I'll tell you this: each each clone is more evil than the clone that preceded it. I see. So I'll pose a question to you: Do I seem more evil than F. Scott Fitzgerald one? Um. Well, you've been rather lovely in this interview, but I would say that reading The Great Gatsby two, there is something more evil about The Great Gatsby two than The Great Gatsby 1. So, at least within your writer's heart, I would say, yes, there is more evil. I see, I see. Well, The Great Gatsby, the Great Gatsby 1, it's a, very, it's a very depressing book. It is a very depressing book. It's a book about people who have their, have their, their hopes thwarted and their, their dreams broken. Mm-hmm. And The Great Gatsby 2, everyone, everyone gets to live out their dreams. They may be eventually killed by a wizard or a shoegaze musician, that might happen. But in the meantime, they get to fuck a lot and do cocaine and become a vampire. So in a, in a certain sense, I, I find it a, a, a kinder, a more idealistic novel than The Great Gatsby 1. I suppose. Although, we, I feel we get glimpses into worlds and people that are so much darker than even the worst nights in New York or far more than what the eyes of T.J. Ackerberg gazed uh, in the spring and summer of 1922. Are you referring to Wizardland? Uh, yes, among many other things. I am referring to Wizardland. And uh, mis- uh, Correct me if I am mistaken, um, was it Gambino the sex dwarf? It was uh, Gumbi Adana. Gumbi Adana. Gumbi Adana the sex dwarf, who is, of course, for those who may not have read the novel, is the sex dwarf of the wizard, who who goes unnamed. He is simply known as the wizard. I see. It it seems a bit of a step, uh, a further step than, say, the flappers of the 1920s to have a sex dwarf. 
Well, yes, I, many things have changed since the 1920s. You know, it's been, it's been almost 100 years. Back then they had flappers and geeks who, who you know, ate, ate chickens. Mm -hmm. Today we have everyone eats chickens. It's normal now. Yes. We have all kinds of new things. We have, we have new drugs. We have MDMA. We have LSD. We have sex dwarves. People are fucking each other in the streets. Oh, he, he spills a little. Oh, I know, I know, I quite know. I see. Um, it was worth it to make a point. I wanted to ask, um, there's been some speculation. When did you write The Great Gatsby uh, 2? I believe it was 2021, is that correct? Uh, well, yes. I mean, the, the notes for The Great Gatsby 2, of course, have been compiling since the events of the novel happened, mm. which is roughly around 1925. 1923, 1925. It's, it's not quite clear. It doesn't matter. Uh, I believe it is uh, 1922 is when the main events happen, and 1924 is when the uh, epilogue happens. Yes, well, it's, it's, it's up to the reader, really. Um, I, I've been compiling notes. I've been consulting, of course, with uh, the Great Gatsby 8, who is the current Great Gatsby. I see. Um, there have been a number of clones over the years. The Great Gatsby 7, of course, uh, sacrificed himself by opening a portal to hell in order to create uh, the, the Baz Luhrmann movie, the quite excellent movie that I have right here, I The see. Great Gatsby. Uh, the Great Gatsby 8 being the current Great Gatsby, he, he has um, some of the memories of, of The Great Gatsby, but of course he is significantly more evil. He was a resource, but not the only resource, um, and of course largely imagination, uh, that led to the creation of The Great Gatsby 2, uh, finally in 2020, yes, but 2021, rather. Mm -hmm. But um, it, was, it was a long process of, of pre-writing and gathering research materials. When you're, when you're writing characters uh, from real life and from, from the work of F. Scott Fitzgerald 1, there's quite a bit of research that goes into that, beyond the regular research of doing doing cocaine and heroin and staring at circus freaks that goes into any novel. Yes. Quite a lot of research into the historical personages of people like Ernest Hemingway I, who shows up as a character. The various great Gatsby's, all real people. Boz Lerman, a real man. The Pope. I, so, something you said that has uh, stuck with me is, did, did you say that, um, did you say the Great Gatsby's are real? The Great Gatsby, yes, currently we are on the Great Gatsby 8, uh -huh. possibly soon to be the Great Gatsby 9. Um, there have been a number of clones of the Great Gatsby over the years. Of course, the original Great Gatsby was a character from F. Scott Fitzgerald's one novel. He died. The Great Gatsby 2 came about. That's the subject of my novel. Um, and of course, there have been numerous other Great Gatsby's throughout the years. And I have met and I have consulted with them. Um, although they are, they are quite evil. Quite awful, terrible people. Or in the Great Gatsby's case, a cyborg. Yes. Yes. He, he has robotic parts. Um... But they were as unpleasant as they are to deal with, because they are quite evil. Mm -hmm. An invaluable resource for this project. I see. Um, I wanted to uh, wanted you to um, either confirm or quash this rumor. Did you, in fact, fight in the robot wars? Yes, let's continue. I prefer not to talk about the robot wars. Have you uh, spoken to Ernest Hemingway too recently? 
Oh, in a semi way too. Yes, we've been in we've been in close contact. Uh, as I mentioned, he has uh, told me about his his upcoming novel, which I will not name, but I can I can say with confidence that it is an excellent work, and. Uh, Absolutely worthy of the legacy of Ernest Hemingway One. I see. Now, um, this is another rumor that you can either confirm, deny, quash, or um, simply avoid talking about if you're not comfortable. But there have been some accusations that your choice to publish The Great Gatsby Two in 2021 uh, corresponded with the bringing of the book into the public domain and the property of Gatsby into the public domain. And I, I'm curious, as you are F. Scott Fitzgerald too, would you have been able to publish a sequel to The Great Gatsby before it became public domain? Or does your, um, or does the fact that you are merely a sequel of F. Scott Fitzgerald not permit you to publish works uh, under his name? Well, American copyright law is quite confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be unclear where the rights lie. Uh, and so uh, I consulted with my lawyers and they agreed that it might be best, as is addressed in the book. Mm. that it might be best to wait until The Great Gatsby One became public domain. Mm -hmm. Although, um, the book was not completed until 2021 anyway. Mm -hmm. um, had I completed it sooner, I of course would have looked into the process of whether it would have been possible to publish it prior. But uh, thankfully we were, we were spared that struggle because 2021 is when the book was completed, and that's when the book came out. And at that point, Great Gatsby 2, Great Gatsby rather, Great Gatsby 1, was already in the public domain, and there were no issues. Very good. Do you have um, anything you would like to tell your readers or anyone who is watching this channel? I would say that people should if I can give some advice, particularly to any writers out there who may be watching, aspiring writers. Read widely. Read, of course, my, my books. Read F. Scott Fitzgerald 1. Read Ernest Hemingway's 1 and 2. Look at circus freaks. Do cocaine. Do heroin. Do DMT. Do LSD. Do MDMA. Smoke marijuana. Smoke cigarettes, drink alcohol, drink absinthe, drink poison, drink cough syrup, drink lean, stare at circus freaks, fuck pussy, go to the circus, fuck at the circus, stare into the sun until you go blind. That's how you become a writer. I could have given a better answer. And furthermore, I will say, Hanky's. Oh, I don't believe we can air that. I think that will have to be uh, censored. Well, that's unfortunate. That is unfortunate. Oh, hello there. I'm sorry, I was sniffing some glue, but you know what you should do? Read The Great Gatsby 2! The Greatest Gatsby 2, Chapter 6. 6. Fun fact, Chapter 6 was originally titled Revenge of the Gatsby, but F. Scott Fitzgerald actually changed it to Return of the Gatsby right before its theatrical release. The Great Gatsby 2 went into the vape shop. to the vape shop. But the great Gatsby too went into the vape shop. What'll it be, sir? said the vape shop guy.
I would like a hundred vapes that are made of gold, because I'm very rich, said the great Gatsby too. That's a good choice. You do seem very rich, said the vape shop guy. I am, yes. I would also like a gallon of vape juice, said the great Gatsby too. What flavor, said the vape shop guy. One of each, because I'm so rich, said the great Gatsby too. He paid for his vape juice and left. Another fun fact, this book has caused me to lose the will to live. Good night, thank you for calling the Gatsby Hotel. How can I help? Hello, uh, I was hoping to book a convention. Okay. Um, how many rooms are you looking for? Uh... Probably about ten. About ten. And would it be just for a room, or do you need, like, a conference room? Uh, conference rooms will probably do. Okay, because we're just only, we only have rooms. Uh, we do not have a conference room or anything. Hmm, okay. Well, regular rooms will probably do. Okay, so normally for group bookings, um, I can provide you with an email address. You could reach out to the person in charge and they can work a better rate for you. Okay, well, I don't think you know who I am. I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I'm Jay Gatsby. I'm your boss. Oh, okay. How are you, sir? I'm doing very good, thank you. Normally for group rates, our um, general manager, who is an lady, or Sharina, they provide rates once it's a group. But um, if you like, I can check for you as well. Uh, yes, please do. Okay, so if we are to provide you with normal rates, can you tell me what date you're looking for? I'd say uh, April 20th. April 20th, and it's just for one night? Uh, just for one night, yes? Okay, one moment, please. Okay, so for April 20th, we have our um, Gatsby full, which goes for a rate of $315.63 per night. And we have our Queen room, which goes for $327.10 per night. Uh, those are the rates per night for one room each. But like I said, if you like, I could probably have um, Nalini reach out to you directly and we can work a better rate for you with Cooperate. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm second guessing this whole thing. Uh, have a good night. That was part four of The Great Gatsby One. Have a good night. One, two, three.